Well, for further insights on uh, the recent comments made by Ayatollah Khamenei, we're now joined by peace activist and commentator Sarwaz Ruhola Rezvi, who's joining us from Bom. Also, we have uh, Iranian affairs expert Karim Sharara joining us uh, from the Lebanese capital, Beirut. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Let's start off with uh, Mr. Uh, Rezvi. Sir, give us your thoughts on uh, the uh, uh, recent comments made by uh, leader of Iran's Islamic Revolution, Ayatollah Sayyidina Khamenei. Thank you for having me. Um, the, the most important point that dragged my attention in the speech of today of Imam Khamenei, which was on the uh, occasion of the Bi'athat of the Holy Prophet of Islam, the day uh, in which the Prophet of Islam, based upon the narrations of uh, so many Muslims, was chosen as the Prophet, uh, is uh, the, uh, the, the crisis, the ongoing crisis in Yemen. Uh, People of world should know what's going on in Yemen, unfortunately. Almost based on the reports, some like 16 million people in Yemen are facing a critical and crisis situation, specifically when famine is again back after almost two years in Yemen. And tens of thousands of Yemeni people are living in a catastrophic situation. And this is all taking place in front of United Nations and in front of new administration in U.S. This is what was pointed and mentioned and highlighted among those points highlighted by Imam Khamenei today, that let's have a look what's going on in front of the eyes of the world, in front of you and in front of U.S., in front of this new government that's claiming to looking after peace at the region. This, was, this has been the claim of the United States since decades, since when they entered the region and occupied countries at the region that they're looking after democracy. But the result of their democracy, the result of their presence is this, that neglecting, closing their eyes on all the trustees committed by their allied region, Saudi Arabia, and now, uh, you know, medical centers in Yemen are facing a crisis. It's a crisis of fuel. Medical centers cannot run by this. And the Hodeida port in Yemen is blocked by the warships of Saudi Arabia, not allowing to any international group, any international organization to come and help and send them fuel and send them, you know, their, their necessities. And this is resulting uh, to uh, a, a catastrophe inside Yemen. And this is all taking place in front of the eyes of the world. And no one is talking about this. The countries of the region are looking after one by one the Arab countries, most of the Arab countries looking after normalizing the ties with the Zionist regime and closing their eyes on the daily base, you know, human rights violation taking place by Saudi Arabia, by United States of America and by, and by of course, Zionist regime in the region. And this is something that was highlighted again by the uh, in the speech of Imam Khamenei today. And that was, I think, really important in this condition to uh, to think and to talk about it more. Let's cross over to Beirut now. Karim Sharara, give us uh, your thoughts on the recent comments made by Ayatollah Khamenei. He pointed out uh, the hypocrisy of uh, the uh, United States, uh, where, uh, in his words, uh, they claim to support human rights while backing those who violate them. Uh, of course, he was alluding to the, uh, to the Saudis, uh, where Ayatollah Khamenei said they've been bombing Yemen for six years, and uh, the uh, United States, even the UN, have been silent towards their crimes, and also uh, we have to look at the case of uh, the murder of Jamal Khashoggi as well. When has the United States never used human rights as a crutch or as a stepladder in order to justify their own moral, moral superiority? I mean, the, the the issue of human rights is only recent, so to speak, in uh, as a strategy used by the United States. If you're looking, if you want to look at history. Well, you have the white man's burden, you have modernization, you have a number of things that the United States and the West has used in order to justify its own moral superior superiority. And in order to justify this context of alterity of the other and the need to bring the other up to, up to your own level. So any atrocities committed by the West or by the United States in particular is automatically justified because, well, it's necessary. Violence is necessary. Uh, atrocities are necessary and they're forgiven because, well, it was done out of necessity. So on the one hand, you have this context and on the other, it's it's not just a step there, it's also a crutch because you, you can always lean on it whenever you're in trouble. So it's always convenient that uh, uh, human rights abuses occur in Iran, occur by 
uh, so-called terrorist organizations, which are in effect, uh, take it, uh, which are basically here in our region. And it's pretty presumptuous that you, the United States would come to our region and claim that we are the we have a destabilizing effect. Uh, say, for example, um, the the case of Jamal Khashoggi was, which very conveniently just comes into the, the spotlight whenever they want to pressure bin Salman or whenever they need to deliver a certain message. And it fades out of public attention whenever things are good and you don't want to stress the Saudis and when you need them. Or when the Saudis uh, succeed in pressuring the United States into caving into their own demands. On the other hand, you have Yemen, the, the century's most I mean, most deplorable uh, human human rights abuses are taking place there every day, and there you have complete silence and complete compliance of the, on part of the United States and the United Nations, which can only, oh, I mean, on a day by day basis, on a weekly basis, stress its uh, concern over the over the situation in Yemen. Well, it's your allies that are committing this. It, you are the enablers that uh, you, you're enabling Saudi Arabia to commit these atrocities. And you're only saying in passing that, yes, we need to revise our relationship with Saudi Arabia. That's very convenient. Also, Abu Ghraib, the Abu Ghraib, uh, the, the, the case of Abu Ghraib in, uh, after the, uh, I mean, in Iraq. Uh, I mean, when, the, when did the, uh, the, the prisoners ever see justice there? When, I mean, did the perpetrators ever get anything uh, other than a stop on the wrist? What about the Mai Lai massacre in Vietnam? What about anything, the, any other massacre that the United States has enabled or, uh, or, or committed? The, the issue of human rights abuses is a crutch used by the United States whenever it's convenient, whenever they need to pressure their allies, whenever they need to use it against anyone countering Uni United States abuses in the region. Let's uh, address uh, that final notion to uh, Mr. Rizvi in Rome. Um, Ayatollah Khamenei, he, he slammed uh, the U.S.'s presence in Syria, uh, arguing, uh, first of all, that Washington created a military base there without the permission of Damascus. Let's talk about that as well. He has also called uh, for the withdrawal of American forces from Syria and Iraq and the region. Uh, overall, um, the U.S. has been claiming that uh, the... Uh, um, Islamic Republic's activities are destabilizing to the region, but we have to look at the facts uh, on the ground, and it's uh, the other way around, basically, uh, uh, that the United States has been causing most of the instability in the region with its presence here. Indeed, indeed. The presence of the I Iranians over there, everyone knows that was based on the, you know, coordinations and the agreements with the Damascus, with the legitimate Syrian government, but it is United States of America that made use of the condition, of course, in one sense, they were those who created this mess for the region and infiltrated those jihadi groups and supported them from back doors and then supported them by money, by, by, by equipments, by, uh, you know, uh, by all, all the means and ways that they could to you know, topple this Assad government inside Syria. And when they were defeated, of course, it was the presence of the resistance forces who stopped Syria from becoming another Libya. They uh, still kept on their presence over there. The presence of the United States of, of America in Syria is illegal based on all the international rules and regulations. Of course, U.S. has proved that they are not looking after, you know, in a permission, they are not looking at what they did in Iraq. They entered and they attacked Iraq without any permission from U.N. Security Council, without any international, you know, uh, they started their own alliance, their own, you know, coalition of war and attacked Iraq. And this is what they did in Afghanistan and this is what they did in Syria as well. Of course, if there is any force, any foreign force that is destabilizing the region, it is presence. It is, of course, at the very beginning, the presence of the United States of America at the region, specifically in Syria. And these, these, you know, these allegations are baseless against Iran. If Iran was not there, if Iran was not going to, you know, recently we had this, we had the trip of Pope to uh, Iraq, 
if there is still anything called as the minorities, non-Muslim minorities in Syria and Iraq, this is all because of the sacrifice done by the resistant, general resistant forces who were there and who fought against those, you know, militias, those, you know, armed groups, Takfiri groups and Harlan groups who were against all the, you know, uh, all the minorities, all the non-Muslims, all the non, you know, uh, Sunnis and Shias who were not thinking like them. And they, they were planning to you know, eradicate and eliminate all those, you know, people from the face of this region. And Iran, its allies in Iraq, in Lebanon, and all the resistance forces stopped them. So if there is any legitimate destabilizing force of the region, indeed, it's the United States of America. And another issue uh, that uh, the leader pointed out was the hypocrisy of the United States when it comes to nuclear weapons. Mr. Sharada, the United States has the largest nuclear arsenal, but it claims that it's against nuclear weapons. How do you explain uh, the inconsistency there? Well, of course, the United States isn't about to give up a, anything that puts it a cut above the rest in, well, I wouldn't say deterrence, but in, uh, in weapons of mass destruction. I mean, chemical warfare is okay as long as it's, as it's, committed, by, as it's committed by your enemies, but I mean, uh, by our enemies, that is. But when the United States uses it, well, it's a necessity. Of course, uh, the, the sustainment of this nuclear arsenal by the U.S., and it's, uh, of course, it's outdated uh, and prone to, to, prone to malfunction. Uh, I mean, it only goes to show that the United States isn't about to give up something that, uh, that will deter any other power from uh, from attacking it but i mean i mean this is what the united states is using as an as an excuse because well losing the nuclear arsenal doesn't automatically make the united states any lesser of any less of a power and it, of course you can always go around this with international treaties as it did with the non proliferation treaty so this is just an an excuse this is just a it isn't a mode of de a mode of deterrence as much as 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 it's a convenient trump card that you uh, ironically that you can use against your enemies because if you attack us well then we'll have nothing to do but resort to nuclear weapons and it's justified and they can use their media to justify it and have people uh, buy into this so they're keeping these nuclear weapons isn't just for show it's convenient it's a mode of it's 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 a mode of deterrence, but it, but it's also a last a last weapon of resort. They're willing to. I mean, if they use it once, they're willing to use it again. It's just a matter of justifying their use of nuclear weapons. All right, thanks a lot, gentlemen. Sabros Rulo Rezvi, peace activist and commentator, joining us from Rome. Also, thanks to Iranian affairs expert Karim Sharada speaking to us from the uh, Lebanese capital, Beirut.